Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Beyond the Headlines and Political Tours. Vladimir Putin has effectively been in power in Russia since 1999. Today, a referendum is underway that, if all goes according to plan, may permit him to stay in office until 2036. For some autocrats, COVID-19 has been the perfect cover to cement power. But will that be the case with Russia? Joining us here to discuss President Putin and his grip on power are Konstantin von Eggert, former editor of Commerzant Radio and now of Deutsche Welle, and Leonid Ragazin, a frequent contributor with Bloomberg magazine and the author of several Lonely Planet guides in Russia. Leonid is also currently writing a book on modern Russian history and the city of Volgograd, formerly Stalingrad. Um, if you've got questions, everyone, I can see a wonderful array of people joining us um, as I talk. If you've got questions, please do have a look at the Q&A bubble just below here. You, know, you can start putting in questions straight away. Uh, and also, please do stay on with us at the end of the hour where we have our own discussion and we just talk about what we've been hearing about. And it's your opportunity to give your views as well. Um, I think, Kostya, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Um, can you say what's been happening this week in Russia and why it's significant, Konstantin. Thank you very much, Nick. It's always lovely to take part in um, what Political Tours does. Um, and uh, I think that um, what we've seen in the last week, or effectively the last few weeks, uh, was the last push by the Kremlin, by Vladimir Putin, to um, consolidate his power for the next, come to think of it, 16 years. The vote that you mentioned, you can't legally call it a referendum. Actually, uh, this is, frankly speaking, a vote that is illegal in a sense that nothing like that exists in Russian constitution or in Russian law generally. Uh, this um, vote uh, is supposed to be the final point of popular acclamation of Vladimir Putin as Russia's, Russia's past, present, and future leader. It has no other meaning than that, because as I said, from the constitutional and legal point of view, it's an extremely dubious exercise. Uh, to do that, uh, not only Putin started preparations as far back as January, when he first announced his plans to amend the Russian constitution, uh, but uh, also uh, preparations um, include, first and foremost of all, lifting, de facto lifting of uh, quarantine, COVID-19 quarantine in major Russian cities in order for people to be able to come and vote, as well as um, just uh, yesterday, uh, 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 presenting or rather conducting uh, V-Day parade, which was supposed to happen on 9th of May, Russia celebrates uh, the day on, on the 9th rather than 8th of May, uh, which was a belated reminder uh, to the public that Putin's presidency is not just some kind of tin pot, crackpot dictatorship, but actually is rooted in recent and previous Soviet and Russian history. Um, and uh, this major parade, which was very poorly attended, if you come to think of it, with regard to foreign guests, was this display of military might and resurgence of Russia, which Putin coveted all the time, continues to covet, and will continue to covet uh, in the future. Uh, I think that uh, the importance of what we've seen is that these events and the no doubt officially successful vote uh, that will be thoroughly rigged, there's no doubt about that, uh, is to solidify not only Putin's image with regard to the public at home, which we will all probably discuss later in the hour, but to present a certain image to the West, uh, which was a source of problems for Putin, especially in the last uh, six years since the annexation of, of Crimea and generally him launching a war against Ukraine in 2014. So this idea, that not only Putin will give himself huge uh, maneuvering space domestically to eject himself from the Kremlin, not to stay in the Kremlin uh, as long as he wants or whenever he wants, but also to show the West 
that all attempts to undermine his regime will be futile because he's extremely powerful and extremely popular. And I have to say, and this is probably where I'm going to start winding up, uh, there is a very important thing to be understood, or several important things to be understood about. <laughs> First and foremost of all, uh, it is a regime that is in constant struggle for survival. Even when nothing threatens him physically, it is a regime that's afraid of being overthrown, of being changed. Uh, and, and this is a constanta of, of the thinking, of Putin's thinking, 24-7. Number two, uh, Russian so-called foreign and security policy is absolutely rooted in domestic issues, i.e. Putin considers that keeping this adversarial relations with the outside world is very, very important for him to keep Russians mobilized around him and around the Kremlin. I'll give you a metaphor. It's, he sees himself as a commandant of a besieged fortress, which is called Russia. And number three, uh, talking about the outside world, when Putin is thinking about the outside world, he's not thinking trite, he's not thinking, even to some extent, individual countries. The only thing he thinks about is the United States. He is obsessed with the United States. Russian political class or Russian ruling clique or whatever you call it is obsessed with the United States. For the Kremlin, the sun rises and sets in Washington, D.C. And this is something that will also continue to inform Putin's thinking. And to some extent, what we've seen in the last few weeks is him showing, A, we will overcome COVID. B, we are militarily strong. And C, we have our own worldview, we have our view of ourselves in the historical context, which is unbeatable and which we will never surrender. Okay, there's a huge amount to look at there, and I don't think we're going to be able to tackle it all in one go. And before we go to it, uh, Leonid, I want to turn to you. And um, I think what many people outside Russia perhaps don't understand <clears throat> is how... Um, legitimate, perhaps, um, Putin has been seen by his own population, how he's managed to survive, what's been the key to his success throughout all this time? We're talking about 20 years, and he couldn't have done that without some, if there was universal opposition to him, it would have been very difficult for him to get through it. So, um, and then I want to come on to the question of what's going on at the moment. But can you feel, deal with that first bit first? What, how has he managed to stay in power for so long? What is the key to success? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's the most important thing that should be said about Putin is that he is a majoritarian leader. Uh, he has been, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, genuinely uh, representative of the majority of Russians, like it or not. Uh, and... Um, uh, solidifying this majority is why, um, and I, I totally agree with Kostya on, on that matter, is uh, or mobilization of uh, this majority is why he is conducting those uh, pompous parades. And, um, and and that's why he also attacked uh, Ukraine and, uh, um, and grabbed uh, Crimea for Russia. It's, it's all about uh, being with the majority. It's always about uh, feeling what the majority wants. And um, uh, there is uh, a lot of economic uh, logic involved in this uh, as well, because for the first, um, there, there are two parts in, uh, in the 20 years of for Putin's rule. <clears throat> the first part is associated with a very rapid uh, rise of the economy. Uh, or more importantly, a, a very rapid, um, uh, spectacular rise of uh, um, people's incomes. People started uh, living better. And then the second um, decade is associated with uh, economic stagnation. And that's uh, when uh, Putin had to be more inventive. And uh, one, uh, one of his inventions, <laughs> one of his tricks, uh, was the attack on uh, the attack on Ukraine, and um, uh, they carefully, very careful. It was uh, opportunistic, of course. He couldn't have expected a revolution in Ukraine uh, starting up, uh, and he was lucky with that uh, because uh, there was this chance to grab Crimea, which has a 
quite a symbolic uh, meaning for Russia, not in uh, any spiritual way as Putin tried to present it, but simply because uh, loads and loads of Russians, millions of Russians have been to Crimea. They do understand uh, what um, uh, the sentiments, what kind of sentiments uh, people in Crimea harbor, that these are pro-Russian sentiments. And it was kind of a very clear case to sell to the Russian uh, population. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing on the economic side, you, you can't always, and I don't think this is Putin's intention to uh, expand the empire, to uh, grab uh, other countries. I really believe that Crimea was a one-off. Um, the other thing they're doing is, um, is uh, a quite major uh, infrastructural uh, investment, which started in Moscow. Moscow was... Uh, um, renovated uh, very thoroughly, uh, grotesquely, I would say. Uh, loads and loads of money was spent on it, and you can say, uh, and critics of Putin would say, uh, wasted on this reconstruction. Uh, but the city is, uh, it's like, it's looking like a new city, especially when it comes to transport infrastructure. Uh, the um, <clears throat> And the investment uh, into uh, new metro stations, into new lines, was on par with uh, the greatest Chinese cities, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Shanghai and uh, Beijing. Um, so this uh, experience, from from what I'm seeing uh, when I travel in Russia, when I travel outside of Moscow, uh, this uh, program has been uh, <clears throat> expanded uh, to. Um, uh, to other cities, first of all, to a uh, million plus um, cities. Uh, <clears throat> they account for about a quarter of the Russian population together with Moscow, uh, but also uh, smaller places um, are <clears throat> feeling the change. There is there is a number of uh, government grants and there is open I'm just going to uh, cut in there, Lena, just to sort of push it along a bit, but just to sort of sum that up. Um, from sort of 2000 onwards, that, that, there's that oil boom in which there's a real uh, increase in, in wages and, and compared to the instability of the, of the 1990s, ordinary Russians do see a substantial change to their, to their lives, a real improvement. Um, then there's economic stagnation, and at the same time, uh, Russia begins to have more conflict with the West, and there's a greater sense of nationalism. And then there's this third period you're talking about, which is um, greater capital expenditure. And I was reading about this yesterday as a three, $390 billion um, expend, capital expenditure program on those projects that you were talking about, which makes those cities um, uh, look you know, more beautiful. Whether or not it's having an impact on people's wages, I, I don't know. Um, well, it, it, it has an impact on people's uh, mentality because living in a Soviet city, Soviet cities were green. And changing, uh, changing the cities, beautifying the cities, uh, it means a lot for people. Right. So the question is, what, what in, in your assessment, what's going... I mean, I can understand his necessity to have this referendum to try and solidify his power and enable him to carry on just as, as, a, as a technicality. But why does he need the public support? And, and what, in your view, because I get the sense that both of you are critical of this, what new, to start with you, Leonid, what's going wrong for him now? Well, we can uh, um, we can only guess uh, what uh, his intention really is, and many people uh, would be convinced that he really wants to stay in power till 2036. Uh, there is a second school of thought which uh, suggests that uh, maybe he wants to uh, create sort of a, a safe space until. Uh, the end of his uh, current presidential term in 2024, uh, for him not to be a lame duck um, during these years and not to let uh, the rest of the elite to start uh, fighting for power uh, and um, uh, disregarding him as the leader, uh, that could be a possibility. Um, so we are dealing with a very uh, non-transparent uh, circle of people Mm. We don't really know to which extent uh, Putin is, um, uh, is, is, is a kind of leader who cannot be objected or defied by the others. Um, we don't really know what is happening in uh, those um, offices. Mm. Um, so, um, 
And uh, on the other hand, they don't know what uh, what the people, how the um, uh, sentiments, how the political, the uh, public opinion will change in the next six years. Um, so I guess uh, it's it's a game of guessing for them as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're trying the first the main thing they're trying to create uh, is uh, what they think would be a very smooth and uh, safe. Uh, uh, what is uh, four years uh, till till the next election, and mm-hmm. then when the next election cycle will come, uh, there'll be a new uh, wave of troubles for them mm-hmm. and for us, I believe. Constantine, we haven't spoken about COVID and and how that's impacted upon things. Um, it, it's gone. While the official f- figures have been played down a bit, I think it's universally accepted Russia's having a pretty bad time. Does that impact upon the referendum? I think to some extent, yes, but of course, in a non-transparent um, environment, which Russia is, you can't believe the figures. I think the accepted wisdom is that um, the current figures, I think, which today are 7,000 plus infected uh, across Russia uh, a day. I mean, now uh, the, the number of those who uh, 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 were ill with coronavirus is close to 600,000 officially. Well, some of them recovered. Uh, but I think the accepted wisdom is that it's maybe at least twice as high. Uh, I suppose that such things do have an effect, and it's a psychological effect. I think that Putin did not handle uh, this epidemic particularly well. He was late to announce what was a de facto quarantine, which was not called quarantine, which was called uh, days off, something again that does not exist, like the famed or infamous um, referendum does not exist in Russian labor code. Um, he also immediately um, shifted all responsibility for tackling the pandemic on regional governors. And that is really, I think, something that will eventually hit him very hard because he spent 15, more than 15 years destroying every possible uh, element of self-government in Russia. His governors, regional governors, of whom there are 80 plus, are in fact uh, appointed by the Kremlin and appointed on one single basis. They should be loyal. And suddenly he said, well, by the way, apart from being loyal, you have to be professional, you have to know how to count the money, have to take the initiative. And you, I mean, he was selecting people on exactly the opposite skill set mm-hmm. uh, for 15 years. Now suddenly they have to do something that they were not essentially trying to do. Uh, I think that this has a certain, will have a certain impact. But I also think, and that's quite important, that COVID came at a time when repeated uh, public opinion surveys, including Libada Center, which is the most um, respected independent pollster in Russia started showing that gradually, not dramatically, paradigm of priorities of the Russian public started to shift away from this neo-imperialist grandstanding and away from this um, expansionist foreign policy to more domestic issues. That's not surprising because even according to Rostat, which is the official statistics body of the Russian Federation, real disposable incomes of Russian households were falling and continue to fall for six years on since the Crimean. The ruble was devalued three times over six years. Uh, The economy did not reach yet its level of 2013. And uh, generally what's also important, people got used to the idea that the Crimea is Russian. It doesn't mobilize people anymore. Mm. So these shifts in public opinion combined with the fact that it's the same Putin on same television screens for 20 years. I think that, and you, I see it also as Leonid, I do travel in Russia quite frequently in, in Russian regions. You do feel that things started to gradually change. And how this will impact Russian public opinion together with COVID remains to be seen. I do not think, my personal feeling is that, I do not think that such events or such impact can be assessed overnight. It can be assessed in democracies where votes are counted fairly, where uh, parties and leaders, when facing real defeat, uh, say, thank you very much, bye-bye, I concede. 
It's not like that in Russia. Mm -hmm. So overall, political and social effects of things like COVID, prolonged financial uh, and economic crisis, uh, corruption, the fact that people are going to, they are already losing jobs, all that will have to bear and will have to bear fruit over time, probably over the coming months. I think by the end of this year, we'll have a much clearer picture what the result was. I do not think it was very positive for Putin. Yeah. Leonid, I, I, you're, you've got a, your take is slightly different to that, isn't it? Um, well, no, no, not really. I, I do agree with Kostya on that. Um, I think... Um, well, we're not having a BBC-style debate. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, um, this, uh, this, um, uh, this referendum, um, um, I think it will, hit, uh, it will hit Putin at the end of the day. Uh, and it's uh, directly linked to how he handled the COVID crisis. Um, uh, because he, it, and it's, it's quite uh, apparent to everyone in, uh, in Russia, to people who support him and to people who don't support him, uh, that he lifted uh, the quarantine uh, too early when there were still um, a lot of infections. Uh, at the moment when he lifted the quarantine, there were uh, something like 9,000, between 9 and 10,000 infections per day. It is now down to 7,000. Uh, um, so the, um, the decline, there is a decline, at least according to the official figures, but it is very slow. Uh, but he, is di he did all of that just to hold this uh, military parade, uh, and he did it to hold the referendum. And the two are conflated because uh, victory parade is, uh, it is symbolic. Uh, it makes him look like a victor. Uh, it makes, uh, it makes uh, Putin uh, um, sort of... Uh, Use um, use the the victory that was achieved by the Soviet people in 1945 for his political goals today. Uh, he he is attaching himself to this victory. Um, mm. But people, I don't think they are stupid, and uh, people are quite genuinely concerned about uh, their health. They don't want to die from COVID. Um, so um, I, this this vote. Uh, uh, and so the preparations for this vote and the amount of uh, quite obvious rigging that is uh, going on, I think it is quite telling. Uh, telling in terms of how nervous the authorities are and to what extent, uh, uh, how far they are prepared to go in terms of uh, violating their own rules, violating their own, um, their own laws. For 20 years, uh, Putin uh, and the Kremlin have been very careful uh, to preserve the semblance of democracy. Uh, for many, for, for, for two decades, for at least 15 years at least, uh, Russia was very much like today's uh, Hungary, for example, uh, like an Eastern European country, which is uh, moving towards uh, proper authoritar authoritarianism, but uh, not quite there. And now Russia is very properly, uh, a proper, dictatorship, you may call it, a proper authoritarian country, even though it is um, a majoritarian kind of uh, uh, authoritarianism. Uh, but um, uh, if you look at uh, the, um, uh, as I do, if you talk to lots of people in Moscow, if you look uh, to, at reactions on, on Facebook and everywhere, um, at times, it seems that in Moscow, the capital, it is uh, simply impossible to find a person who is uh, voting for those amendments in the, uh, in the referendum. And that presents a major problem for uh, Putin in such a centralized country as Russia, uh, because uh, um, as history showed in 1991 and before that in 1917, uh, in Russia, all that matters is uh, who is in charge of the capital. If the capital is taken over by, uh, uh, by revolutionaries, uh, then it's uh, over for the previous regime. Um, so um, in a way, um, uh, if uh, Putin loses the majority in Moscow, uh, which he might very well have lost already, uh, 
he's in 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 a major trouble. You just wait for uh, a major wave of protests, and uh, as soon as there is a million people in the streets, as I remember was the case in 1991 at the end of the uh, coup, um, then uh, the military, the police will just turn to the side of the people. And I think what can trigger and uh, what can influence those um, uh, sentiments in Russia is what is happening in Belarus today, a like very similar situation, um, a tougher regime actually, more tougher than Russian. Uh, and the guy, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, who's been in charge for the last, uh, what is it, 24 years, uh, and um, and people were content for a long while. Then they were not content, uh, but they were silent. Uh, but suddenly, it just it burst. Uh, if you look at um, if you go on Facebook groups uh, somewhere in provincial towns uh, in Belarus, like Brest or Magilov or Vitebsk, you will see very very ordinary people far beyond the urban middle class. Uh, discussing how they hate Lukashenko, how they want him to go, uh, and this is this is not uh, you know pro-Western people. Who, I mean, all these uh, Western cliches are really meaningless in terms of what they what these people want. What they really want, they want this guy to go now, uh, and so the same can very well happen to Putin. That's well, pretty pretty shocking to hear you saying that. I'm. Um, um... <clears throat> it it's almost seems unbelievable that you could think of that countenance any alternative to him. It, um, and, and that does open a huge number of questions. First of all, the whole system, Constantin, is 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 structured around the Kremlin and structured around him. So it, it's um, very difficult to see how the opposition could topple him. I mean, could, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on the current state of the, the opposition, Constantin? And please oh. and start asking your questions um, here in the Q and A box, here, just do start typing away. There's a lot of you there. I'm sure there are lots of questions you've got. So please go ahead and start writing them in there. Go on, Constantine. Um, well, it is the question of questions in many ways, Nick. Uh, I think that uh, first of all, Putin has spent um, the last 20 years uh, making sure that no credible opposition emerges. And frankly speaking, yes, today most of the opposition is not particularly strong. Even the strongest of them all, Mr. Alexei Navalny, the anti-corruption crusader, and uh, someone who's been in Russian politics for 10 years now, uh, is, or even more, um, they, they, they are no match for Putin because in some ways the problem, and this is very difficult to understand for uh, Western audience, hmm. the problem is that Putin never lends himself to any kind of direct debate at home. Um, ever since 1990, 1991, the first presidential election in Russia when Boris Yeltsin was elected, not a single sitting Russian president ever took part in presidential debates. So uh, the idea is that whoever is the leader is actually the czar who's really, really running the country while debating is for ninnies, it's for chatterboxes, is for irresponsible people. So Putin has never had, apart from occasional interviews with Western media, uh, he was never challenged on major issues of uh, politics and policies. Uh, so, and he intends it to remain as it is. Now that has a big drawback. Um, it's, to some extent, I'm originally a historian of the Middle East, I spent some time there. It starts to remind me of, let's say, uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, who's been president for 31 years. And his tactic was exactly the same. Um, he's the, basically, he's running the rostrum, he's, he's running the whole show. And if he needs opposition, it's usually, you know, the Islamists, so he can easily present to the public a, a, a dichotomy, a, a choice. It's either me or these crazy bearded guys. And the public repeatedly thought, okay, fine, we'd rather stay with good old Hosni. Until one day it completely ended for essentially not, not much reason at all because a, a grocer in Tunisia than himself, mm. coached himself. So I think to some extent Putin is using it, especially using it 
uh, with the Western audiences saying, well, I'm the only guarantor of stability in Russia. And if not, horrible Russian Nazis will come. That's why he keeps uh, pushing to the forefront and, and inside Russia too all these kind of veterans of Ukraine wars, which are really sort of Nazis, there's no doubt yeah. about that. <laughs> um, or some crazy communists. So yeah. what he's saying, look, dear uh, uh, President Trump, dear Prime Minister Johnson, dear President Duda of Poland, dear middle classes in Moscow and St. Petersburg, yeah, I'm not be, I might not be the greatest guy you can get in the Kremlin, but in case I'm gone, you're going to get these guys. Do you want it? Yeah. And I'm afraid that this starts to fray, not even at the margins, but starts to really eat into Putin's legitimacy and Putin's authority, that people do want change, for no particular reason at all that they want change. Usually you can't explain it, apart from the fact that he's been around for 20 years. And I think that what's going to come very soon is that this narrative of either I or chaos, I'm standing between you and chaos, is not going to work. And the question is, who will be able to present uh, a convincing, but at the same time inspiring, forward-looking vision for Russia, which Putin is and will never be able, or rather is unable and will never be able uh, to produce. So for now, he is still in control of most of the information space most of public opinion. But I think that what you see bubbling under the surface are changes which are only natural. And as Leonid rightly referred to 1991, come to think of it, a system which looked fairly solid collapsed in a matter of five years, which is nothing in terms of history. Mm -hmm. Nothing. In fact, three years, I would say. So uh, we have to learn lessons from history. I don't mean that Russia will collapse like the Soviet Union. I don't think that Russians want it, actually. But I think that changes, when changes come, they will be sudden and dramatic. Okay, okay. We've got some questions coming through now, so we can start to bring those up, Isabel, um, starting with um, Diane Cook, just in the same order that have been asked there. Um, so I think we'll take, we'll take um, uh, t two at a time. Um, and I, I, do you know what I'm going to do? I think there are two questions here. It's a, a similar a, um, two questions. There's one from Diana Cook uh, and also from Anna Logan. And I don't know if I can bring those up. Diana, have we got Diane Cook up there? Yeah, Diane Cook, do you want to ask your questions? Go on, your microphone's open now, Diane. You may need to unplug it at your end. Just check your microphone is um, unlocked. Are you okay, Diana? Yeah, are you, you're okay now. Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, on. okay. Um, this is really based on, um, I've recently read Catherine Bolton's book about Putin's people, and my question is, can Putin ever leave the Kremlin alive? And then um, I'm also going to go to Anna Logan and get her question at the same time, and there are two questions of what I'll ask later, which have a more of an economic dimension. So let's just follow up Dana Cooks with um, Anna Logan. Anna, you ask your question as well. Go on, Anna. Uh, I'm wondering about the church's power in Russia. Is it, does it always support Putin on every issue? So Constantine, let's just start with, that's one of your favorite subjects. Um, can Putin leave the criminal alive? And then we'll go on to the church. <laughs> Um, well, I think that usually leaders like Putin, authoritarian leaders like Putin, can leave their, their res respective Kremlins alive if they initiate the process. I, if they say, I will go, but on certain conditions. Now, I do not see Putin doing that. I think he's going to stay on till the very end. And this is complicated also by one specific thing to which I would like to draw your attention is something that happens in the Netherlands right now and in The Hague. And this is a, a, a court case in which uh, three Russian citizens and one Ukrainian citizen stand mm -hmm. accused of complicity in shooting down uh, flight MH17, the Malaysian airliner, over Ukraine in July 2014. Um, the court is supposed to investigate how the missile launcher found itself or was deployed 
to Ukraine uh, and how it shut down the airline. The Kremlin is extremely worried by that because if the Dutch court goes all the way, it has to establish the chain of command. The chain of command leads to the Kremlin. Now, I think that Putin is, in this respect, is cornered because no leader wants to be branded a war criminal. And this is what is actually at stake in The Hague. This basically impacts his judgment, to my mind, quite significantly, and makes him, and will make him stay till the bitter end. Okay. With so regard to the questions, Kostya, because I, I'm going to cut you short because we've got, I've got about, I can see all these questions piling up on my right hand side here, so I need to get through them. So I'm going to stop you there, Leonid. Talk about the church's relationship with the Kremlin. Is it solely wedded to Putin? Could it shift elsewhere, Leonid? Yeah, church is really across the subject, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, in, in, in my opinion, as a, as a very secular person and uh, a person completely outside the church, uh, uh, not even baptized. Uh, yes, the church is the extension, is the arm of the state. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, it was created uh, and you from the scratch in the Soviet times as an arm of the um, secret services in Russia. And that's, that's what it remains. Um, the church is completely controlled by the state. And yes, it endorses uh, uh, with some caveats. Uh, there are some caveats like uh, the church uh, sort of doesn't officially recognize the um, annexation of Crimea. The, uh, um, the church in Crimea is still under, um, under the church in Ukraine, which is also controlled by Russia, by the Russian Orthodox uh, Church in Ukraine. Uh, but um, uh, if you, apart from this, uh, uh, this caveat, uh, yes, it is, uh, it is fully controlled. Uh, it, is a, it is the means of... Um, uh, mobilizing people, mobilizing the uh, what is often referred to as uh, conservative vote uh, in Russia. Uh, it's it's um, it's a question. It's debatable to which extent this vote is conservative. Maybe it's uh, it's not conservative. Maybe it, maybe it is radical far right. Uh, but yes, the church helps in um, solidifying it. Okay, let, let's bring up um, Annie McMahon is disguised as um, Simon Jackson. So um, Annie does not look grisly with a beard. Um, <laughs> Annie, do you want to go ahead? You, um, it was very interesting what you said about the, um, the burst of, of investment in um, infrastructure to prettify cities. Was there a parallel investment in healthcare facilities? Um, I had read at one point a, a statistic I could barely believe that something like 25% of healthcare facilities um, did not have running water. And I wondered, having had some experience with healthcare facilities in parts of the former Soviet Union, I was curious to know if they have, uh, what the, you know, the current status of them is. I'll, I'll just chip in and I would say on our, on our tours, we've seen some pretty abysmal healthcare facilities on some of our travels, um, particularly in Kazan, for example, despite it being a region with a huge amount of wealth. Uh, do you both of you want to chip in on that briefly? What what, what have you seen in terms of um, uh, the development of healthcare in in the last decade? Well, I can say I can say a few words. So uh, I think I I agree I I'd agree with your assessment of uh, healthcare system being uh, abysmal. Uh, on running water, that's uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I believe uh, every hospital in Russia. Well, 99% of hospitals in Russia uh, have run in water, uh, but um, the, the equipment is uh, very outdated. And yes, there has been investment. Uh, so it's, it's always important to compare Russia to, to its neighbors, uh, economically and, uh, and in terms of infra infrastructural um, development, especially to the neighbors that uh, um, are showcases of sort of pro-Western course, and uh, pro-Western development. And that's uh, first, uh, first and foremost, that's Ukraine, a country that is very similar to Russia and a country where half of the population uh, speaks Russian language. So if you speak about Ukraine, health system in Ukraine is, uh, is almost, um, it's not non-existent, but it's, uh, uh, if Russian, uh, if Russian um, health care system is, is abysmal, then uh, in Ukraine it's just, um, well, it just is beyond horrible. Uh, um, in Russia, you can hope to uh, to to uh, to get uh, some kind of basic treatment 
and uh, very often not so basic treatment. Um, the hospitals that I've seen in Moscow, um, uh, some of them are quite quite well equipped. And uh, this has been spreading across Russia. There were new uh, centers, uh, oncological centers, cardiological centers being built across the country. Uh, none of that were happening in, uh, in neighboring countries. Um, so uh, it's pretty bad the COVID um, crisis uh, showed, uh, highlighted once again how bad it is, uh, but uh, it's not it's not catastrophically awful. Okay, um, let, let's bring up Lynn Maddock. Um, Lynn, if you're there, if you, do you want to ask your question? Go on, Lynn, go on. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, my understanding is that the Russian economy was travelling pretty badly before COVID, um, and I think some IMF figures out today show a about a six to seven percent hit to GDP in the coming year for Russia on top of their, their current economic performance. Um, how do you think Putin will respond to that? Uh, Costa, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, you worked at Commerce um, Radio. Commerce is the main sort of economic um, media publishing house in, in Russia, so you do have a perspective on markets. Russia's also built up a huge sovereign wealth fund. It's got a very, very low debt to GDP ratio. Um, and it's also managed to protect itself from international contagion. It's quite self-sufficient because, funnily enough, of, um, of sanctions. So it, it isn't, isn't Russia quite secure despite COVID? You forgot that I also worked as vice president of ExxonMobil Russia. So I do know something about oil and gas in, yeah. in, in, in Russia. Um, uh, well, I think that there are definitely, there, there are going to be, uh, negative consequences of COVID combined with sanctions. And by the way, we haven't seen the last of the sanctions yet because what we see now brewing up on Capitol Hill is an amazingly strong set of um, sanctions against Russian state banks and Russian uh, sovereign, sovereign debt, which may hit Russia even harder, uh, the Russian regime. But I also have to say that in addition to the uh, sovereign wealth fund, which I keep hearing is being depleted, actually on supporting state-owned enterprises, which correspond to or produce 60% of Russia's GDP. It is a de facto state economy or state-dominated economy. But I also think once you're selling oil and gas, you always have that basic something to keep you going. Um, and I think that although it seems that the government is prepared in Russia to spend more now on keeping up the economy, on you know, social, social welfare handouts and things like that, uh, may not be enough. But what I think is going to happen is that the government will continue to prop up these huge behemoths of uh, Russian industry like Rosneft, like Gazprom, like uh, Rostec, like Russian railways, Aeroflot, you name it. And it will leave medium and small businesses in the lurch. They'll tell, well, you know, you never really paid taxes if you didn't manage to uh, stock a bit of money before the crisis, then that's your problem. Um, I think that long term, what will happen, that will con contribute to potential political instability because this very, very clear disregard of interests of me medium and small businesses which are disproportionately situated in, in bigger cities and in, in Russia's metropolises, will feed this idea of the city middle classes, even those who were previously depoliticized, that, okay, the government left us in the lurch. So basically it didn't do enough for us. And looking at Europe now, I mean, they all have, you know, they all have access to social media and to, to the internet, and say, well, it definitely wasn't enough. Mm. And I think that, in the long term, again, this crisis will contribute to politicization of the city middle classes, which were not, or those of them, that were not politicized by that time. I do think that Putin, though, will survive. It's not going to be like major economic crisis that is going to blow up the Kremlin, but it will be impacting the self-feeling self, self of uh, people inside Russia. Yeah, Leonid, um, do you agree with that? Do you think um, COVID is going to have a big dramatic effect? And also, I just want to pick you up on Ukraine. The, the comparison I would make would be with um, 
post-Soviet satellite states like um, Romania and Bulgaria, who have done you know, very, very well with obviously a lot of money from the European Union, but also a huge amount of economic reform that Russia hasn't undertaken. And you've traveled with us, uh, we've traveled with you in, in to places like you get your Katrinburg, and we've seen those villages where there are no young people left. All the young people have gone away. They've got nothing to live for. And the, 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 the big conglomerates don't have the people to employ because they're just going away. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about Bulgaria and, and uh, Romania, because my, my personal experience is uh, getting ill in, in Macedonia, which is not an EU country, but it's, it's a candidate for EU membership. And so the moment I found myself in a Macedonian uh, uh, hospital, North Macedonian hospital, as we call it now, um, I, I wished I was in a Russian hospital. I really <laughs> Very sincerely wished it was a Russian hospital at that point. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not sure about that. Um, what I what I wanted to add uh, on to, to what Costa said is uh, uh, that the um, uh, the equation, the political and economic equation, is not as uh, as linear as it seems. If um, it's not necessarily the fact that uh, if um, economic um, rates, then Putin will go. On the contrary, if it deteriorates because of Western sanctions, that could be a way for Putin to uh, solidify uh, his his majority again, uh, because um, there is there is a very uh, genuine uh, fear of the West in the country. Uh, the um, previous um, uh, wars and uh, conflicts they uh, came from the West. That's that's just the the, the fact of life in Russia. And um, even uh, the changes, the collapse of the Soviet Union, what, which uh, was brought about by the Russian people themselves, uh, in, in the hindsight, it is uh, perceived by many people as, uh, um, as an act of aggression from the West, as something that uh, the West manipulated Russians into doing. And again, like it or not, that's, the, that's a very common perception of Russia. So if um, those uh, sanctions, uh, uh, if the grip on those sanctions uh, is, is being increased, and if these sanctions uh, will come across as, as extremely unjust, then it, it, it will actually help Putin. On the other hand, um, what was happening during Putin years uh, especially during the first 10 years of, uh, of um, very rapid economic rise, uh, is that it is, um, it is the fact that Russians were becoming richer, which uh, gave them more time to think about politics. Uh, it was giving them more time to think about uh, uh, how their country should look like and uh, uh, what the political system would be like. It gave them time to relax from this uh, psychosis uh, caused by the Soviet years and by the turmoil of the 1990s. And, uh, and that resulted in Balotnaya protests on, in 2012. The Balotnaya protests uh, were caused not by Russians getting poor, they were getting richer. Uh, it was caused by Russians, by these tectonic cultural shifts that were happening uh, under Putin, that continue to happen under Putin, uh, whereby uh, the political regime was deteriorating and getting more and more authoritarian, but society moving in a very opposite direction. So by the tw uh, 20 years after uh, Putin's rule, I would say that Russia has never been so Western as it is now. Uh, culturally and socially in terms of what people watch, what people eat, how they live, uh, uh, their, their lifestyles and everything. So that, uh, that actually works against Putin. So it's, it's a very um, sort of fine and uh, complicated equation. Okay. Um, a, a fascinating way of looking at it, a complex one too. Um, Jim Lernstein, let's, let's bring up your question. Jim, your microphone open. Yeah, go on, Jim. Uh, yes. Uh, well, even even dictators are human beings, and I wondered what we know about Putin's personal life, and whether that influences in any way any aspect of his views on policies, on personal preferences, etc. Um. Uh, does anyone know the story about the rat, the starving rat, and uh, being in the in the corner during? I think it's the end of the war. Someone got that story? Yes, of course. Go, go on, Kostya. Go on. 
Well, it is a story. I mean, but before I answer, can I can I finally raise a point of disagreement with Leonid because otherwise it was looking very too 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 trop visible, I would say. Um, I think the uh, the question here is that this Westernization it is important because it touches upon the most active part of society uh, in big metropolis in metropolises. Metropolises are big. Um, I think that it's still a minority. So to say that uh, the Russian society is westernized is, I think, a bit of an exaggeration. There are huge pockets of extremely Soviet thinking. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I do disagree on, uh, on, on the sanctions issue. I think that this idea that somehow you can mobilize people by telling them, well, by the way, you know, Congress is hitting Rosneft again. Uh, it's been decreasing over the last two years. Oh, not only the last two, but yeah, over the last two, 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 three years, probably. Gradually, this idea that somehow the West is the, the cause of all evil uh, is uh, becoming less strong. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I do think it's not such a mobilizing idea anymore. So I'd be cautious saying that sanctions will suddenly contribute uh, to... Uh, to to an upshoot in Putin's popularity. I'd be much, much more cautious. I don't think they'll have such a positive effect for him uh, in terms of reaching out to public. I, I, need both to... Of you, I need both of you to rattle through what we know about Putin before we analyze it. So just... just... Uh, the rat story is that Putin, in one of his interviews, or was it in his uh, book, famous book from first person, um, uh, he said that he witnessed um, a rat uh, that was hungry and that was cornered and the rat, which was, and he was a boy, a school boy, probably he wanted to kill a rat. I do think that he doesn't like, you know, he probably was kind of engaging in animal torture at the time. Um, I think that he is, uh, what he said is that he was surprised at the fierceness with which the rat uh, hit him or rather attacked him or the boys that were around him. Uh, although it was such a small animal, they were completely taken aback. and. That's his basic, his inference is always, don't call on me because I'm going to be so bloody mad, you're all going to regret it. Um, it's it's a kind of thing you see in Middle Eastern bazaars sometimes. You no, know, hold me, I'm going to cut Muhammad to pieces. I mean, it's it's something that that does have a certain cultural resonance, but I do think to a large extent is always a play, it's always play acting, it's always trying to look much stronger and much more desperate than you are in fact. With regard to his family, very simply, he keeps his family away from the limelight. He never recognized implicitly what his daughters are doing. He doesn't even recognize them as adult persons. When he's asking them about them, he says, those two women you mentioned, but at least in two interviews with, his, uh, with this Russia stooge, uh, what's his name, the director, Oliver Stone, um, and with the uh, with, the, with the recent documentary shown a few days ago on Russian television, he admitted that he has grandchildren. So that's the extent to which we know uh, about him. We also know that one of his daughters is married to a Dutch guy, or at least was married to a Dutch guy who works for Gazprom. Uh, we do know that they sit on the boards of a couple of uh, very lucrative, uh, lucrative, lucratively financed um, institutions, uh, which are financed, by the way, by state-owned enterprises. Um, what we do know also is that Putin is afraid of revealing too much about his family, absolutely genuinely afraid, because he thinks they will be targeted uh, both by potential assassins, by the opposition, and maybe by the West. So what we do know is that the daughter that lived in, in, the, in, 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 in the Netherlands has been repatriated to Russia uh, in uh, 2014. But again, this is an outstandingly stunning piece of Putin's statesmanship that for 20 years we do not know, we've seen his former wife, okay, fine. But really, imagine you wouldn't know who Ivanka Trump is. Right. That's the extent to which Putin is secretive. Yeah. Leonid, tell, tell us more about his, I mean, he, he's, um, he, he's, he got remarried. Tell us more about his personal life, if you can. I don't know about that, by the way. Leonid, I'd be interested to know. Yeah, but, uh, but it's um, it's it's all been it's all been in, in, in the news. There, he he had a wife um, from from his uh, uh, Leningrad days uh, from from a long time ago, and uh, 
uh, he, he became president uh, with her becoming the, the first lady. Um, but then it was, um, and then she was involved in politics. She, she was appearing uh, in, on, on various occasions. Uh, most famously, she was uh, uh, campaigning for Russian language, for um, people improving their language skills and writing better and so on. Uh, but then she um, uh, disappeared. Uh, she started disappearing from sight uh, gradually, and the official line was that she was not interested in politics. Uh, uh, at some point, she disappeared completely, and uh, and then um, all of a sudden uh, they announced um, a divorce. Um, and um, uh, later on, there were publications uh, to the effect. Uh, uh, I mean, both of them were. Uh, uh, reportedly, I uh, had uh, um, uh, had partners. Uh, um, she she appeared with a with a young uh, developer, um, like a guy, a guy who was uh, I think ten or fifteen years younger than her, and um, um, investigator um, uh, investigative journalist uh, linked them to a um, to a certain chateau in in France, uh, uh, where this couple may or may not uh, have been living for some time. And then with Putin himself, there was this persistent rumor about uh, <clears throat> him having a uh, gymnast, uh, Alina Kabayeva, as his uh, girlfriend. Um, and again, it has never been, uh, has never been properly refuted. Uh, uh, many people who are close to the Kremlin were talking about it as, as a fact. Uh, Okay. Uh, but then finally, we, we don't really know. I think I think there's That's there's philosophic. How does it influence his behavior? What does it say about his policies and his behavior? I mean, Costa, you said that he's maintained this incredibly tight uh, control of, of his um, you know persona. There, there's uh, you know you see the muscular pictures of him on horseback and hunting and shooting. That's the image that he likes to convey. Putin, the strong man. But we know so very little. I mean, is there anything else that we can say about his personal life that has any impact on what he? On, on I think I think what we what we um, uh, the, the, um, it's not what we need to say. It's it's it's, it's how we need to to frame it. So what 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 we need to uh, think about it when uh, when we discuss it. Uh, they created this uh, non completely non transparent bubble where we don't know what they're doing in terms of their. Uh, um, marriages in terms of their sex life, uh, sex lives, we don't know completely. They are absolutely protected from public uh, scrutiny. We have some glimpses of that. Um, I mean, my uh, exa an example of a glimpse I had as a journalist, um, I was traveling with um, uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky for, for the BBC, uh, the leader of the Quasi opposition party, which uh, uh, rubber stamps uh, most of the decisions by the Kremlin, but uh, it is considered the opposition. His uh, his uh, his party and parcel of uh, Putin's regime. Uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky in the 1990s, there were many reports about him being a pedophile, uh, and there were um, there were videos uh, which you can still find on the internet. Uh, where he attends a you know a public bath with loads of uh, boys of uh, unclear you know age, and um, and also um, there was this famous video of him um, bathing in a pond with uh, uh, with boys who were quite clearly under age. Uh, so what what I saw on this trip is that he was basically surrounded by uh, men who were. Maybe not underage, but they look by like uh, male prostitutes. I'm sorry, that's 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 how it looked. And there were like 20 of them around him. And they, uh, when he was entering the Pacific Ocean on camera, uh, this these guys rushed to roll his uh, his uh, his trousers. Uh, so they they un unbuttoned his uh, his his shoes and he, they rolled his trousers. They they really um, behaved like slaves. So that's that's what makes me think what kind of uh, relationships and what kind of uh, um, things are possible within this uh, within this circle. We hear other rumors. Uh, we know we, we suspect, uh, uh, despite despite Putin being so you know strict on gay propaganda and being so anti-gay, uh, we know. More or less exactly because we have gay friends and gay friends go to gay clubs in Moscow and they do meet all these people from the Kremlin there in gay clubs. We approximately know who in the Kremlin is gay. 
Um, there is nothing wrong about being gay, but uh, these people who don't tell, they, they, they are very deeply in the closet. Okay. Um, but uh, I suspect there is more than just people being gay. And uh, the, we, um, the way to frame it is, is it's, it's all about the incentive, why these people are staying in power, what makes them stay. It's not the stage where it is money, at least not for all of them. It is, it is more. And um, I think this uh, unhinged, uncontrolled behavior is, is part, of the, uh, part of the incentive. And there will be very interesting books uh, written when all of these people go. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, for those of you who don't know, both Konstantin and Leonid have been our, our experts at various times. Um, we've had our weekend in Western Park with Konstantin. Um, I think it was actually at, at um, Gunston, actually. Uh, we've had them as uh, experts at the various events and also experts on tour, both in the Baltics and also in Russia. Our next tour in Russia is due in May next year, and it normally coincides with the Victory Parade, unless they change it again next year. We are due to be there in May of next year. Well, well. maybe in Navalny's Victory Parade. No, uh, no. Who knows? <laughs> we've got time for one more question. Sheila de Belague, you've got a question. Sheila, go ahead and ask your question. Sheila? Oh, not too, there we go. She is just coming up now. Sheila, if you, if you can unplug your microphone, if we can unplug your microphone, you should oh, yeah. be. There we go. Go ahead, Sheila. Go okay. on. Um, we've Ooh. recently had um, on, tele on television uh, the dramatization of the Salisbury poisonings, the Skripal poisonings. And um, I, my question is really what do ordinary Russian people think of this case and of the Litvinenko case? Does anyone blame Putin for them? Kostya, do you want to ask that first of all? Answer that first of all? It depends on who you speak to. I think that a minority of people that are really interested in that, um, again, people in Moscow, St. Petersburg, sort of intellectuals, middle class people, uh, most of them know that, oh, quite a lot of them think that it was done by Putin. It's, it's, it's just like a hit job. I think a lot of people do believe uh, that something is not really clear there. Uh, Russia is a place of where conspiracy theories run wild. I mean, in my travels, there are three regions of the world. It's uh, Russia, the Balkans, and the Middle East, where conspiracy theorizing is a way of life. So lots of people do believe it's a, a false flag operation by, I don't know, MI5 to smear Putin. Or it's, I don't know, the Rothschilds, the UFOs, you, you, know the, you know all the possible causes. So I suppose that also, and that's important, I don't know whether Lenin will agree with me. Uh, it's very important for the UK. I think a large part of Russian public opinion is completely forgot about. It. Yeah. Uh, Russians have a very short memory for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and uh, because of that, I don't think it has any big impact on, on public opinion. But there are people who think, it's been done by Putin. Personally, I think it was. Um, and there are those who will still believe, yeah, well, it's all, it's a Western plot to smear Russia. Leonid, yeah, what do you think? No, I, I, I agree. Um, I don't think it's, uh, it's a matter of story in Russia. Um, people are aware of the story. People are aware of different uh, opinions on that story. Um, but uh, it's not nearly as, as big as it is in, uh, in Britain or, or in America. Uh, people uh, in Russia, people are of course prone to conspiracies, but I would say that uh, uh, the United States of America are outdoing Russia uh, on conspiracies these days, a uh, big way. Um, uh, but um, in terms of uh, Salisbury po uh, poisoning, um, it, de it depends on, um, on people's political views. Uh, Russia is quite polarized between people who are vaguely pro-Western and people who are, uh, and the, that's the minority, but it's a very sizable minority, um, maybe a quarter of the population. Um, and so the and Putin's majority, which is um, something like 50% uh, of the population or maybe below now. Um, so depending on that, uh, people will either condemn it uh, in the way uh, the Western public condemns it, or, or if they are pro-Putin, um, maybe maybe they will uh, take the line of uh, the, uh, which which comes from you know this, from Soviet mentality and uh, Soviet movies that uh, traitor should be dead, 
and that's that's um, that's why Putin is and Russia in general uh, is not um, <clears throat> is not trying to hide it too much. Mm. They they I think to to an extent they want to make it obvious that. Uh, um, who they regard a traitor uh, was killed. So in both cases, in uh, Litvinenko and Skripal cases, uh, we're, we're not talking about you know, dissidents. We're talking about uh, former um, former secret agents uh, who were who were killed uh, by um, by their former employer, essentially, mm -hmm. as we as as I believe is the case. Um, so so, so echo, echo what you're saying. The former GRU colonel. We've met on a few occasions just outside Moscow. It certainly echoed your opinion on on both uh, Litvinenko and 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 Skripal. Well, I'm kind of mixing the GRU and KGB into a single uh, you know entity, uh, but um, but yeah, generally it is uh, uh, it is this um, uh, it is very interesting actually this um, this point about the red uh, the red in Russian language. Uh, um, they, it can be translated as mole in you know in secret as in secret service mole. Uh, the rat is uh, the rat is someone who is uh, who is who is the traitor. So this this thing about Putin killing the rat, uh, there is there is this double sense in it. Uh, um, you can uh, to to a certain to a large part of the population in Russia, you can you can sell this uh, notion of uh, of a rat being killed. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it happened in uh, Britain or in America, uh, again, to a part of the population, to maybe a half of the population, you can explain it in the sense that, okay, they, the Americans, the Brits, uh, they, they also undertake uh, operations in, maybe not in Russia, but in Russia's vicinity, uh, which are just as dangerous and uh, just as, uh, uh, just as um, uh, on, um, unsavory. I would say. Um, I've got one more um, question or comment from Nigel Harley to come as well. Nigel, do you want to go and just uh, um, open your microphone and ask your question? Nigel. I'm not too sure. Yeah, Nigel. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, yeah. <clears throat> Good. Um, <clears throat> I understand there's um, a younger cadre of bureaucrats that are coming on uh, <clears throat> within the Kremlin, and they may have considerably more... Um, uh, interest in genuine democratic uh, democratic institutions. Um, in the event of anything happening to the present regime, I mean, what do you? What is your feeling about the ability of these people to uh, be able to take over? I guess. Well, I, I can say a few words about it. Um, it is it is a very good question, actually. Uh, there is there is a generation change, and you can see it uh, in uh, in the kind of governors Putin is appointing in various regions. Um, he he had this pension for appointing his bodyguards, but he stopped doing it. Uh, and so most of the fresh appointments were uh, young technocrats who grew up as politicians during Putin years. And this these guys, I find them. I find them very interesting. They are super pragmatic. Uh, they are also super conformist. That's not uh, the, the worst thing to say about them. Uh, the, um, the regime, the political regime, is uh, generally based on conformism, on uh, masses of people, millions of ordinary people, but also the politicians uh, trying to get a feel for where the majority is at the moment. And the majority, it's, it's shifting all the time. Uh, there are tectonic shifts going uh, in in society and in culture, uh, and um, this um, this young cutters they are educated to be very sensitive to this shift, and uh, culturally and educationally, these people are uh, they are ready to become you know bureaucrats. If you transplant one of these guys into Hungary or Germany or whenever, they'll be perfect bureaucrats instantly. They are they have the same psychology as East European and Western politicians. It's just a bit of grooming or maybe not even that. Uh, they are ready to do that. Uh, so everything really depends on those uh, tectonic cultural shifts that are happening in Russia. Once they feel that Russia is ripe for or wants more liberalization, more democracy, undoubtedly they, they will go in that direction. Actually, Putin initially, he was like that as well. 
we've seen different Putins, and I believe Putin can still change. Maybe that's, that's my just it's my guess. Uh, but um, uh, most people of various generations, but especially those young coders, they are completely prepared to uh, change Russia if Russians ask for it. Um, since we've both got you still here, I'm going to take another one. I'm, I'm taking advantage of you, I know. Um, Louise Tarrant, you've got a, a question here too, which I think is quite interesting. Louise, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Go I, was just, I was just curious about the link between Putin's regime and sort of the hacker industry, particularly given the events of Trump's election, etc. So just interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I, there was, I was reading something about the, um, the referendum and a, a video being put out in um, by a St. Petersburg company controlled by the same people who were accused of um, doing a lot of the hacking during the, um, the US elections. Uh, did, did either of you see something about that? It was... Um, yeah, it was this uh, video about gay adoption. Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think that I can, frankly, I can add you have to be a specialist on that. There are, there are people that are very good at that. Um, uh, uh, to describe to you the hacking industry, I actually think that Russia's hacking industry is very quickly becoming obsolete compared to the Chinese online onslaught. Uh, but I think that, um, of course, uh, it is a political tool. Of course, it is uh, just like the uh, famous or infamous uh, Wagner private security company, uh, which produces mercenaries. Mm, uh, they are tools of uh, surreptitiously using or promoting state interests with very, 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 uh, sort of, I wouldn't say very plausible, but a very well de developed deniability. Um, and I think that Putin finds these uh, quasi state methods of uh, influencing public opinion or actually fighting wars, as, as is the case with Wagner, uh, very, very efficient because he denies things. He says, we don't know about anything about it, like his daughters, these two women. Um, I also think that, uh, and that's very important, I think that all this hacking operation, although full disclosure, I do not think that Donald Trump was elected solely because Russia supported him. It's just impossible to elect the president of the United States if it doesn't have, uh, uh, if he doesn't have really popular support. Uh, what I think is clear is that Putin's, Putin's main, adver main adversary, as I said, is the United States, or at least he thinks about it. What he's interested in, he's interested in chaos in the camps, in the camp of his main adversary which is collectively the West. So what he's going to push, he's going to push anti-Americanism in Europe, in the European Union, in the UK. Uh, and it doesn't matter who is the recipient. If it's the far right, the far left, it doesn't matter. As long as you don't like the United States, as long as you are prepared to kind of blow up the dance floor, you are Putin's, Putin's ally. The same goes for the United States. I'm sure that Eventually, we will know that uh, Putin's, um, uh, Putin's trolls were working very, very hard to help both BLM people and the white supremacist people, the Boogaloo guys. Uh, I think that he's interested in chaos in the West because that provides two things for him. One is a propaganda image. Okay, well, listen to them. You want the well, well you want that? That's one. And number two, as long as the West, collective West, the United States, Europe, NATO, you name it, is preoccupied with its own problems, it won't have time to deal with Putin. It's a very simple, commonsensical policy in many ways. And he's been so far quite effective in, uh, in promoting it, also because quite a lot of Western politicians, including especially, I mean, people in Paris and Berlin, are prepared to say, well, you know, you have to understand Putin, and he has certain points to score, and you, know, uh, you can't really deny that he's right in certain things. And, uh, and this kind of, Putin also is very good, and his trolls and his propaganda machine are very good at what about it. Do you tell him, oh, what about the Crimea? Oh, what about Iraq? Or what about Kosovo? 
Well, what about something else? So I think that this combination of very, well, of unlimited resources dedicated to that, plus this very clever whataboutism and promotion of chaos. In this respect, Putin is an equal opportunity employee. And he doesn't care whether you're a communist or a monarchist or whatever, as long as you do his job. Uh, I think these factors provide for a very effective um, hybrid warfare. However, I do think that in the end, we will, we will all see Putin being a completely sort of kindergarten, uh, kindergarten boy compared to the Chinese. Okay. Um, I'm going to take, um, um, there's a question that I'm going to ask on, on Hillary Matthews' behalf to learn it. We're running, we're well over time here, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, Hillary says the Russians have no tradition of Western style democracy. Why should the majority who support um, Putin want change? They don't know any other style of governance. You know, the, the, what we're seeing with COVID, what's going on at the moment, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that Russians want anything different. Well, so that's a slightly uh, fatalist um, point of view, and uh, and it's also not historically accurate. Um, Russia had at least elements of Western democracy at various periods in time. It um, after the in, in the late nineteenth century, after the reforms of Alexander II, it had uh, quite well developed self government. And it was moving in the same direction as some um, other European empires at the same time, European uh, countries towards, uh, towards greater democracy. Um, there, was, um, there was a parliament elected uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the first um, uh, two decades of the uh, 20th century. There were different parties. And then, of course, we had uh, 1990s when, when it was a full-blown democracy in Russia and uh, different parties. Uh, you can argue about uh, Yeltsin's regime, but, uh, well, not Yeltsin's regime, but at the time, the Yeltsin's era, that's, that would be correct. Uh, but uh, by, by uh, the West's own standards applied to other countries in Eastern Europe, that was a full-blown democracy. Um, and um, and Russia, Russia does definitely have that experience. Um, I'm, I quite agree with uh, Francis Fukuyama on that. Uh, there, is, there is nothing in Russia that prevents it from being <clears throat> like everybody else. Uh, there, is a, there is a set of concrete uh, circumstances and uh, uh, the West is uh, to a large extent to blame itself for, uh, for what Russia is now. Uh, there is there's historically a lot uh, to be said about the role of different Western countries in bringing Russia to where it is now um, as, a, as a country that is uh, peripheral, as a country that was uh, often disregarded and, um, and uh, invaded right away as, as Nazi Germany did in 1941. Um, so uh, it's... Um, I don't think um, I don't think Russia is uh, uh, prescribed to authoritarianism, and uh, I believe for within our lifespan we will see a very different Russia. There, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, please do stay on the line, everyone, if you want to get, get, make your comments about our discussion. Um, I want to thank Konstantin von Eget and Leonid Ragazin for their time. It's been really interesting, and the proof is that our discussion has gone on. Uh, for one hour and 25 minutes. So we're almost 25 minutes over time. Thank you both very much indeed for your time.